Date with a Debut is a Words and Nerds and Breathe Art podcast co-production, recorded on a Wagbacool country. And I pay my respects to all elders past and present, and extend that to any First Nations people tuning in. Always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. On with the show. The writing journey began because I'm an insomniac, which I like a lot of other people, I think. <laughs> so um, when I should be sleeping in bed, I'm writing stories in my head. Hello, I am Nick Vassilia, former host of Tell Me What to Read, author of When Men Cry, and I'm continuing this series with Words and Nerds shining a light on debut novelists and their journey to publication. If you're looking for a new book to devour, a new author to discover, this is the place to be. If you're looking for writing inspiration, this is the place to be. This is Date with a Debut, because nothing hits you like a first impression. And for our next episode in this series, we're actually going to be doing something a little bit different. Back in 2021, Journey to Words Publishing published a thrilling crime novel titled Shadow, Shadow Over Edmund Street, which received considerable acclaim and was shortlisted for, among other events, the Ned Kelly Awards, the Davitt Awards, the Nego Marsh Awards, and this year it will be published for the first time in New Zealand under Bateman Books. So I'm joined by the author, Suzanne Franken, who is based out of NAM, out of Melbourne, an environmental zoologist and also who works as a chess teacher on the side as well, to just to talk, to talk about this book and the process of publishing in another country. Suzanne, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And I will say that, like, reading that bio, I'm just like, oh, this is an interesting character. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to start your writing journey. The writing journey began because I'm an insomniac, which I like a lot of other people, I think. <laughs> so um, when I should be sleeping in bed, I'm writing stories in my head. And eventually I thought I'd better go and learn how to write them down on paper. So I went to a, a local community centre and I had my first stroke of luck in that the teacher was someone who's since gone on to have a quite a great literary career in Australia and the kind of teacher you wouldn't normally expect to find in a community centre. So I learnt under Lucy Trilla for two years and she then won the text best unpublished uh, novel. So she stopped teaching and went to, uh, took that con took a contract and went on to write three novels. And then I had another teacher who was also um, a writer. And three years learning under them really set me on the road. The second uh, teacher that I had was part of the Sisters in Crime group. I don't know if you've heard of that. There's many, there are so many amazing groups specifically focused on crime writing. This one I am not familiar with, familiar with, but I know that there are so many fantastic ones out there that are all about pushing crime. Uh, so they I are, like and they, they run the uh, Scarlet Stiletto Award, which is a, a huge short story award every year. And... Learning under Lee, I started to focus uh, very heavily on short stories. So uh, the first short story I wrote, on an honourable mention in America, and the second one won one of these Sister and Crime Awards, and I thought, oh, this is fabulous. This is really easy. I should keep doing this. <laughs> of course, I've since learned then that writing short stories is incredibly difficult, and there was a fair amount of luck involved in, in you know, doing well in the beginning. But I love writing short stories. So I was derailed for several years, really, writing short stories, but also learning the fine arts of editing. There's a lot to learn from short story writing. Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hello, it is Nick Wasiliev here, host of Date with a Debut. And I just wanted to reach out and say thank you to all of our incredible listeners on the Words and Nerds platform who have been listening to the podcast and sending messages of support. It has been absolutely humbling to hear from fellow authors, fellow readers, fellow writers, 
and fellow podcast listeners about the show. And it is a real privilege to turn you guys on to many exciting new and upcoming authors. The reason why I'm reaching out here is because one of the groups I've heard the most from is a lot of aspiring writers who have been wanting to learn more about the actual process of getting your book into publication. How do you complete a manuscript? How do you find a publisher? How do you complete the editing process? And how do you get that book printed and into stores? Of course, we cannot fully cover it in an episode of the podcast every single week. But I have another podcast that I dropped in 2021 called A Little Idea. This podcast essentially covers my entire process that I went with my debut novel, When Men Cry, from writing to publication to promotion. Over the course of this five-part mini-series, I sit down with some of the biggest names in the Australian publishing scene to cover this entire process front to back. And the best part, this entire series is completely free and available to listen wherever you get any of your podcasts. Please enjoy this brief snippet from episode three of A Little Idea, where I chat with my editor, Sylvia Balog, around misconceptions that people have around editors and the value that they can bring to your manuscript. To me, every world is exciting. You know, it's just really, and I'm not a writer, so, you know, to to see people come up with these, these creative worlds, it just always blows me away. So I get very, very enthused about it. <laughs> How do you kind of work your way through those kind of misconceptions that people might have towards editors in your own Okay, mind? sure. Um, I mean, I think... Um, a worry that's like a really loaded question. No, no, not at all, not at all. I, I think probably some of the... Uh, some, some people may think that they don't need an editor at all. Some people think that an editor is actually like a, a proofreader, which they are in some ways, but proofreading is another sort of profession itself. Um, where that they just expect the editor to maybe correct spelling and things like that. But what an editor really does is that, like you said, they're there to, and like I mentioned, they're there to hone that manuscript, to, to get the absolute best out of the author in that work. To hear more, head to the links in the description or head to my website, nickwasiliev.com, and check out my podcast, A Little Idea, and start your own writing journey. All right, back to Date with a Debut. What is Shadow Over Edmund Street about? It was always uh, the story of Edwina. And Edwina gets killed on page one. It's not a spoiler to say that. So the book then is really uh, the unravelling of her life. And I struggled a lot um, initially with the structure of the book because I didn't want it to be just a straight police procedural. I wanted it to be her story. And for that, you need to be able to step outside of the, the confines of the police. So in the end, um, it's told from three points of view. That's the policeman, Alex, from um, Rose, one of Edwina's friends, and from because uh, they're... They're a little bit um, clumsy. They tip off the killer. Um, you also see it from the point of view of the killer. So I stole really that idea from Kate Atkinson. Is that the right way to say it? <laughs> great, hey, great, great writers. You know, like you, you can pillage and steal if if you like, but the trick is what you do with it. And uh, yeah. I will say I love this. I love the change of voice, and I love what you've you've done. Before we dive into the meat of the book itself and talk about the these characters that you've crafted. Um, we're in, again, as mentioned at the top of the podcast, we're in a unique situation in this series because up until this point, I've been talking with authors who book, whose books are either just set for release or are, are just about to come out or they've just come yeah. out. But yours in Australia, at least, has been out for a little while, it came out in 2021. Congratulations on all of the short listings. Uh, you, that's the ticket of approval. How has the reaction been? Has it surprised you? Uh, to find myself shortlisted for the Ned Kellys was a huge surprise. Uh, when we were putting them into competitions, I almost said to Jen, well, don't, worry, don't bother about the Ned Kellys uh, because I thought it would be, you know, such a competitive thing. Uh, so, yes, it, it was. But, of course, this has been interwoven with COVID. And it was also, there was a lot of angst going on behind the scenes because um, the publishing house closed down 
And shortly after that, unexpectedly, the principal died. So it was all, there was a high drama behind the scenes, um, even though it was being shortlisted. And basically, the book's life in Australia ended at that point. Um, yeah, that was the end of <laughs> Shadow of Eden Street. <laughs> Look, it's, uh, I think the fact that, it got it got attention and, and interest from a critical perspective is still really something fantastic, and it's great that it now has a second life uh, and it continues on and goes internationally. Let's talk about this book because crime and and detective novels are very much the zeitgeist right now. They're really popular. There's a lot of fantastic writers out there um, producing great work. Um, but even then, this book surprised me in lots of ways. There it was lots of things that I loved in it. The person who has been murdered, Edwina, uh, uh, found strangled in a park miles from her home. And as the the police go digging, they, you know, she's in the midst of a life change. She's making a lot of changes in her life. But even still, the fact that where she is found is still very out of character for the women, for the for the woman that the police paint a picture of in this story. How did this concept? come into your life how did where did this where the hell did this come from well you know I, I told you I don't sleep a lot Nick so there's a <laughs> lot of time picking up stories uh look I grew up in in one of these suburbs and in, in I've lived in three or four countries and there's always one of these suburbs um it's an inner city suburb uh, gone derelict over 100 years and then there's been this great revival so Edwina, uh, her family lived in Ponsonby for over three generations. She lived a very restricted life. I knew lots of people like this. Um, and then obviously uh, as the suburb was revitalised and changed, new people came in and, and it was just an absolute, just a shock, I suppose. So how was she found in a part of the city that she normally wouldn't be there. Well, you'll have to read the book to find out. But it's <laughs> it's all about <laughs> the deep dark secrets that um, people are trying to protect. Mm. Deep dark secrets from a long time ago. Yeah, it's and, oh, yes. We don't want people. It, we, we are trying to keep it keep it spoiler free. But it is. I just love this this concept, and particularly as well. Often it is. The case with these with crime novels is that it, there's a lot of tropes and stereotypes, and particularly yeah. around you know the whole idea of the lone detective. It is often something that has been done to death in a lot of crime novels. Um, I found it so refreshing that you've got the you know one of these viewpoints, Alex Cameron, the detective. Um, so they're surrounded by a real well-oiled machine of detectives who are clearly very diligent at their work they make and which makes the discoveries that they find about Edwina even more surprising um, in that it's it just feels so out of character for her to be where she is. Um, talk me through how you put together this well-oiled team, first and foremost, of detectives that Alex is surrounded by. Gosh, these are tricky questions, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that in this book, the uh, surrounding characters came first. I loved Edwina. I loved um, Mr. Chan. You know, the, the surrounding characters came first. And uh, I really didn't want this to... Uh, look, I'm a bit over these angst-ridden detectives. You know, I just wanted something a little bit different. Um, yeah, I think... As much as I love crime novels, there's a whole pathway that's just been trod so much lately. So, and I can't, whatever I write, there's always a little bit of humour in it. I can't help that. It's, so, yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm not answering your question, am I? <laughs> because What's it? No, I, I like it. Know. I like the place, I like the space that you've come from because, <laughs> yeah, there is, that is one thing about a lot of crime novels there's, these days is that there is a lot of, angst in them and again you touch on it as well there is a lot of humor these and in in this story and also that you want detectives to be good at their job and what they do and this and alex is really a very a, a very diligent worker and i found it 
it added into the story and the intrigue a lot more because I clearly saw that that Alex was really good at what they do, which made the discoveries we find even more surprising. It just yeah. enhanced it enhanced the story so much more as as it was unfurled to me as I t- as I kept turning the page. It was something I just really loved. Well, it's all about insights, um, not heavy on procedure. Mm. That's the difference that I tried to create. Uh, I'm not really keen on the kind of, in fact, I'm disappointed in a lot of the stuff that's coming out of Britain at the moment where it's just overwhelmed with procedure. And um, for me, it's always been about the story. And so... This book is is light on on the police, but it's hopefully heavy on insights. Mm. Alex is a bit of an instinctive person, perhaps. In this book, you have two um, investigations going. You have the police investigation, and then you have the investigation by Edwina's friends. Yes. The neighbourhood investigation, and it's where these two overlap, um, and Alex picks up one or two insights and, and that pushes them into the on the right pathway. So I really wanted it to be more about Edwina and her life, absolutely, than mm. just the police. Absolutely. And uh, let's take this time as well to shout out that community, uh, particularly Rose, um, and, you know, recent friend of Edwina who becomes very important to those insights. And you, you touched on him earlier, but I just want to say I just love Mr. Chan. Uh, I could tell you, I could tell you you enjoyed writing that character. Just such a, a great voice who strengthens every scene he's in. I love these side characters. And I find it interesting that you mentioned you start. This is where the story started for you. The story started with, um, in my mind, with Alex and Mr. Chan sitting outside on the footpath outside the window with all the porcelain, bits of Chinese porcelain and having a cup of tea. Uh, Most of it got cut, actually, but (laughs) um, from the final book, but that's still embedded in my brain. And the character I loved most, of course, was his granddaughter, um, because who wouldn't want to be driving a rose-coloured convertible Mercedes? (laughs) I mean, come on. (laughs) (laughs) And have that level of confidence at that age. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Not something I had, but uh, oh, you, you always know. wish you always wish for it. Uh, to, you could have that sort of confidence. Oh, there's one other thing that I really like, and that of course this book's set in Auckland. Um, mm-hmm. and I really enjoyed that because I feel like there's not that many stories of this nature set in a place like that. I've found myself probably in the last twelve months being gravitating towards a lot of New Zealand fiction of late so more more recently like uh it's been out for a little while but nobody is ever missing uh by Catherine Lacey or in Amber's Wake and more recently by Christine Lenenz of course which I loved that one because it then presented New Zealand in in the 70s during the rainbow the the controversy of the rainbow warrior and the springbok tour Mm -hmm. and it was a side to New Zealand that fascinated me because it, Mm. it was a side that I'm not as familiar with with I have family in in South Island and I've travelled to New Zealand a lot and it's a side that I was not as familiar with. What was it like putting New Zealand on the page? And also what do you think, like, how important it is do you think that we should actually start to feature New Zealand more in a lot more of our fiction novels? Because it feels like Um, it's due. Yeah, there's an awful lot of New Zealand crime writers at the moment and I got blown away. I mean, I was blown off. I might have got shortlisted in these stories, but of course, Jacqueline Bublitz won. Mm, the yes. <laughs> the one New Zealand uh, wonder kid at the moment. Um, and when I write short stories in New Zealand, they go on a completely different tack, and there's angst and beaches and, you know, all sorts of oh, emotional, whatever that uh, doesn't win me prizes <laughs> at all, I can tell you, but as much as I love the stories. I think part of a crime novel is that not only do we get the crime, but we get the insight into a different uh, environment. So this is why Scandi Noir was so popular, because we were getting uh, 
crime set in an environment that people were, had really not seen a great deal of. So it's almost like a two for one, you know. I, I, it went crazy because suddenly we were seeing Iceland featured in, in crime novels. Mm -hmm. And so a little bit of that perhaps happening. People are, are seeing a little bit of Auckland as well, which they haven't seen a great deal, or New Zealand, which they haven't seen a great deal of in books. Mm. But it's, it's very vibrant, the crime scene. I could honestly keep talking about the book, but I also want to ask you a little bit about your journey to publication because it, it looks like a very, a very interesting road, well-travelled. Um, what was that like? It was horrendous, as I think it is. <laughs> and, you know, if I was saying to, to someone, um, you want to write a book, then don't start at my age and don't imagine that if you write a good book, you'll have a chance of having it published. That's not the way it works. I think if you really want to have a book published, go to university, do a creative writing course or go to TAFE to create a write because uh, your lecturers then will have a pathway for you. But just um, sending something in off the slush pile is very, very difficult. So my uh, road to publication was, you know, long and torturous like most other people's. And really all I can say to somebody is just keep sending stuff away because every now and again you might just get lucky. And that's pretty much what happened with me. I think I built up a resume on sh with short stories Got a fair few wins. Uh, so that meant that when I sent a book in, I had, you know, something behind me that was to show that I was a reasonable writer. So people would perhaps uh, read the synopsis and give it a go. But really, uh, in the end, it was a very small indie Melbourne publishing house that picked up the book. Yeah. And I honestly think that that's like there's a. I was chatting with uh, Meg Vertigan, uh, who also went with a smaller publishing house up here in Newcastle, and I think that there actually are a lot of positives that can come from going with a small publishing house. I know that you went through quite a lot of challenges during the time of COVID uh, as well. That kind of I think it affected the can can affect the actual uh, did have an effect on the actual experience. But now with this one, you're going through Bateman. Uh, to get it out into New Zealand. Um, what was the journey of then also adapting it for an international, to kind of move on international, quote unquote, because it's also for, for home. What was that experience like? The experience with Bateman was really quite extraordinary. Uh, I was, was talking to somebody in a uh, bookshop telling them how, you know, the book had kind of fallen over and she said, I'll go and speak to Louisa Bateman. So I spoke to Louisa Bateman and they basically just read the book, took it, and um, that's that. Mm. It's been wonderful. <laughs> so, I was going to say that the book has also been was sold to Elvis Croft, um, which do audio and large print worldwide, and it wasn't altered at all either. So the only problem um, for the New Zealand audience, and I can blame this squarely on my husband, was that I had duvet in the book, and then he said, no, it's Duna. And, of course, every New Zealander that's read it has gone, oh, Duna, what's a Duna? <laughs> you don't want to do that, Absolutely. Yes, it's a, I know, a, a, you asked what a Duna is, we know what a Duna is in Australia, <laughs> but, like, that that's so funny, The it's the small little language things. And it's funny, I was going to ask you about, we were talking about it before we started recording, about what would it have been like doing making adaptations for the New Zealand audience? And you were like, there was barely any because the audience is the, like, apart from those small changes in words and types and types, the audience is, is quite similar to Australia, which what a contrast to, you know, hearing about all the changes that you have to make whenever you have to get a book published in America, for example. Well, New Zealand, there are differences like a uh, cell phone. Do we call them cell phones? What do we call them? Mobiles. Mm. And in New Zealand, they're cells. Now, zucchini and courgette, you know, I, the problem is I've lived in America, Australia, New Zealand and the Philippines, and I forget where the words belong. Do you know whether it's courgette or a zucchini? I don't. <laughs> I call them. 
Well, they're both the same thing, but <laughs> uh, so I haven't met that yet. But the next book, Thieves Bay, will be published in New Zealand, and I expect they'll they'll have a bit to say about the language then. Oh, so. well, you, you've you've led me on to my you've you've beat me to my next question because I was going to ask uh, what's what's next for you. You have another <laughs> book in the works. Almost done. It's with my own editors at the moment. Um, yeah. So when it, I actually started writing, my first articles were published in a yachting magazine. Um, and I, I know very little about yachting, but I have been ended up sailing in different parts of the world because, you know, he get dragged around sometimes. So <laughs> the <laughs> Thieves Bay starts off. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in every year about four or five hundred yachts stream into uh, New Zealand from the Pacific. They come out of the Pacific into New Zealand to get away from the hurricane season mm. and they arrive around about November. So, yeah, a little bit to do with overseas yachting. Mm. Oh, exciting. That'd be, that'd be... <laughs> Exciting to check out something that I'm again not as familiar with, something new to to check, and I'll I'll be keeping a watch on on that next book. <laughs> yeah, it's been quite a performance, but anyway, we're almost there. We're now at the part of the podcast where I hit you with some rapid fire questions. Do not be scared. It's okay. You just give me the first answer that comes to your head. Really? Okay. <laughs> What's your favourite book that you've read in the last 12 months? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> How could you do this to me? <laughs> <laughs> I can honestly say that because I've had my head down read uh, writing, um, Thieves Bay. I've hardly read a book in the last twelve months. I don't blame but, you. That's fair. But I've just um, picked one up from the library, and it's um, my Icelandic or author whose name I can't pronounce. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. You know? Do you know any Icelandic authors? The names of any Icelandic authors? It's the well. It's the world's hardest language, so uh, probably not. <laughs> if I if I try to pronounce it, I'll I'll completely butcher it. <laughs> It's wonderful anyway, and it's something like, and, and just, oh, hang on, I've got it with me. Um, Arnolda Indrasson. There we are. That's my best effort. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, do you have a favourite word? There's almost word. If you come from New Zealand, I can always tell a New Zealander because they use the word actually. Mm. Mm. So I try to avoid favourite words. <laughs> where is your favorite place to read do you like to read in bed do you like to read on the couch or do you like to read at the back in the shade on like on a sunny afternoon yes exactly you've got it out <laughs> the back in the shade and in the sun a little bit in the sun a little bit in the shade yes perfect I like, I like that which crime writer would you like most to meet? So this could be either living, dead, whoever it may be. Who would be the one crime writer that you're like, you know what, I really want to have like a, a coffee with you and just listen to you? Well, John McCarre is um, the kind of person, the kind, he writes the sorts of books that I like because it's all about the mystery, not the crime. Um, Ian Rankin, of course, is amazing. Mm. <laughs> But, um, yeah. I, I could honestly chat to you all day, but I'm aware that you are a very busy person. So I'll finish off by saying to everyone listening, um, get, you, should, you should go and check out Shadow Over Edmund Street. It's published by Journey to Words Publishing in Australia and Bateman Books in New Zealand, which where it will be out uh, this month. We're recording in May, but will be out this month. Um, hope our listeners in New Zealand check it out. And if you like the show, drop Words and Nerds a review. Tell us not, tell us what you think and who you'd like to hear from next. I'll finish off simply by saying, Suzanne, thank you so much. It's been lovely having you on. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nick. It's been a joy.